everyone, welcome to Constellations Conversations with Robert Rowan Smith and myself, Nicola Dunn. Hi, Robert, good to see you. Hi, Nicola, good to see you too. We were thinking about what we would speak about today, and we've decided on the controversial topic of help in a constellation sense. What does it mean to help someone? Is it possible ever to help another? Um, are we instead uh, positioning ourselves to be useful in some kind of way? Um, <clears throat> and what does it mean for the helpy and the help all? So, Robert, what are your thoughts? Well, um, in our culture, help is generally seen as universally a good thing. You know, give me give me a bit of help. Thank you. Uh, I need a bit of help. Or in the Beatles song, help, you know, I need somebody. And um, I think it was in a previous video, we talked about how as human beings, we're actually born into a state of helplessness. Um, and that's one of our I don't know how subjectively we experience that, but objectively, it's obviously the case that as, as little babies, we are almost completely helpless. The only instrument we have uh, to um, signal our will is the is the voice, the cry, really. So we are kind of born into helplessness. So I think there's probably an initial sense in which we are all aware of having needed help, even if you know, we go through a process in life where to become independent is to establish some um, some distance from the need for help. So in a certain way, we, we associate the process of maturing with this transition from needing help to not needing help. Um, and sort of being a grown up is to be able to stand on your own two feet. And so when we talk about adults needing help, um, we're going against, in a sense, a kind of um starting definition of what it is to be a, an adult which is to be you know independent and just be able to kind of sort yourself out but having said that i think there is a kind of cultural shift at least in our part of the world that's gone on sort of subtly i think over i don't know how long a decade two decades where it's become more and more acceptable to ask for help and we've spoken in a previous uh, video about vulnerability and the recognition that vulnerability is is actually okay and even a sign of strength and the helping professions themselves have if not themselves necessarily expanded at least received more approval i suppose in the wider culture so the you know, talking therapies and you know well about this are uh, you know particularly now accepted in a way that 20 years ago perhaps they they weren't were still considered a bit marginal and those seeking that kind of help perhaps perceived as you know, weak or a bit weird even so i think the helping professions and i mean beyond the obvious helping but beyond nursing for example have come into the limelight more and more as well um and then in addition to that we have over the last uh, longer period probably 50 years particularly in america we have the rise of the notion of self-help both uh, particularly in terms of books, publications, and you walk into any bookshop now and self-help is one of the, you know, most prominent sections. Um, so we have self-help as an industry, but also as a practice with people encouraged to, I think, more and more um, adopt rituals of uh, self-help, such as meditation or exercise and so on. So I think help has kind of come out of the shadows <laughs> A bit and become much more acceptable so in that context constellations as a form of help if we're going to use that word um seems to sit quite snugly and yet of course we know and we're going to talk about this help has some difficult difficulties attached to it uh, as well so but i'll stop there with my little um kind of tour d'horizon as the french call it and see what you make of that so far it's great robert um so rich so Help is a banquet, isn't it? And as you said, you know, maybe we've moved from um, a culture that had uh, tight-knit communities, that had people who were wise within those communities, who others consulted. Then we tried to do things sort of quite independently by ourselves for a while. And then we found out, I guess, that we got into some problems without you know, strong community leaders or people, family members we could go to. And so, you know, the helping, I guess, industry or professions became more prominent. Um, so I guess 
what did the consolation world offer as about the concept of help? So Bert Hanninger has, has written and spoken about the art of helping. And I think what he offered us there was a chance for those of us that perhaps try to be useful to others in a professional capacity to really um, drill down deep into what lies behind our helping and uh, the difference between helping guidance and being useful. And uh, a helper who is trying to help others because of their own unmet needs is not helping, they are hindering. And we all will have come across that. The sense is sometimes it's palpable to us that there is a sense that the other that their need is even greater than our own. And um, I don't know how you would come across this, Robert, but for me, I find it quite um, difficult if someone is trying to help me based on their own needs. Mm. Because I think I tend to recoil from that. It doesn't feel a good fit. It feels a clumsy fit. And there's a sense of in order to get them to stop, I just I have to accept the help and hope that they'll go away. Um, but actually being offered something that is useful is often a lot more expansive. And in the constellation world, it's less upfront and close and personal. It's more stepped back and wider and expansive. So the usefulness is often about creating more space around something which feels tight, compacted and stuck. And in a constellation sense, increasing the boundary around the system that we happen to be looking at. Hmm. So for example, a couple might come or a, or a, it might be a work situation, but we're actually expanding things. We're adding more elements in, greater connections and more space between them. Yeah, there's an awful lot in what you just uh, said there, uh, Nicola. So let me pick out one or two things. And also, um, as a marker for later in the conversation, I want to put down the notion of the resource, because in a constellation, we will often bring in a figure as a resource to another representative, which obviously is, a, is in some sense a figure of help. So I want to come back to that too, because that's a, a nuance on, on, on this uh, discussion, I think. But yes, I mean, I think anybody in a helping profession ought to interrogate pretty intensively what their motivations are for helping. And one motivation might be that their need for help is uh, is being um, sort of used as a proxy in that process of helping somebody else. I think another paradox or shadow on the idea of help is that um, to put oneself in the position of helper is obviously to put the other person in the position of being helped. And to be helped can be paradoxically disempowering because now I'm the person who needs help. And if we are trying to help somebody, really what we're trying to do is to strengthen them. And that's um, that's the sort of rule of thumb I use, in, particularly in, in constellations. You know, to what extent am I Will they walk away from this constellation feeling strengthened rather than, for example, you know, impressed by what I've done or, you know, inordinately grateful for my amazing skills? You know, so their uh, their strength is the prize, really, that, that, that we're looking for. And help can both uh, increase their strength, but also diminish their strength in some ways, insofar as it keeps them in the position of helpy as you put it at the beginning so uh one wants to give just enough but not too much help in order to preserve the agency of the person being being helped and i suppose that's why i like your distinction between help uh, be, between the helpful and the useful because i think the helpful has contains the risk of falling back into those slightly codependent dynamics between helper and helpy that you're alluding to whereas being useful as you say has a bit more space in it it's a bit more practical it's a bit more objective it's a bit there's a bit less investment by the part of the constellator in the success of the 
process and their own competence. Um, so I find that a useful, a useful distinction. And I think maybe what helps um, constellators to remain um, useful rather than helpful is a kind of humbleness that um, if you're useful, there's a moment in which your usefulness is no longer needed and your job is to kind of melt away. Mm. Well, yes, exactly. You've used up the use. You know, we've, we've used it. Now we've put it away. You know, can I borrow the screwdriver? Yes. I've, you know, screwed in the screw. And now, thank you very much. You can have it back again. You know, I, I don't need a person standing next to me with a screwdriver for the rest of the day. No, exactly. And you don't owe me this. There's, there's, you know, there is an exchange often in constellation work. But sometimes with help, there is a sense that you're obligated. Mm. And the obligation is something around the uh, helper's need to help. Yeah, it reminds me of Nietzsche's um, caution about gifts, because in a way we can think of, we talk about giving help, and insofar as help is a gift to the other, it, uh, according to Nietzsche, puts the other person in debt. And Nietzsche says, you know, as soon as we're in debt, we are... Uh, we our power is circumscribed and therefore the first thing we have to do is to avenge the gift he says so you never want to be in the position of uh, receiving the gift uh, of course that's Nietzsche so he's on slightly one end of the spectrum but <laughs> there that we are wipes out, wipes out Christmas and Hanukkah and other <laughs> yeah. yeah indeed <laughs> yeah a lot of the reasons why Nietzsche would want to wipe out Christmas but there we go um, but yes um, then I, I mean we were thinking as a title beforehand of course, we just came up with the title "Help" in the end, but we did think of the title "Do No Harm" as a uh, alternative title for our video today. And I've um, often sort of thought about that phrase and how powerful it is. I think, if I'm right, I think it's the first principle in the Hippocratic Oath, um, which says, you know, it's guidance for doctors, isn't it, or medics? before anything else do no harm don't make it worse than you started off you know and i think that's profound in all sorts of ways and i do think with constellations you know one is dealing with a pretty powerful set of energies there and i'm um aware that it's possible for issue holders um to be harmed actually during a in the process of constellation because um there are all sorts of things that can be stirred up and handled poorly they can give messages to the issue holder which are not helpful at all and not strengthening at all um and what what are the kind of harms i i mean i mean i think any constellator who at the end of a process gives direct advice to the issue holder, do this or do that, leave him, don't leave him, have an abortion, don't have an abortion, move to Scotland, don't move to Scotland. I think, you know, we're already stepping across a line there from being useful to being overly helpful and in a way that could cause some harm. And I think I think mainly because the agency there, the decision making shifts away from the issue holder to the constellator as if they are now ruling the life of the issue holder in some way. So it's harmful principally in the sense that agency is diminished or removed. Yes. So um, a helpful, useful constellation is one that supports um, the issue holder or seeker to, as we would say, to take their next step, but it yeah. is their next step. Yeah. And really, you know, it's none of our business whether they stay, they go, they move, they don't. It's that somehow they've got in touch with something that uh, navigates them to a place or a position that is more strengthening for them. Yeah. So it's helpful to the constellator as well, I think, that the next mm. step, away, and it's uh, how, how the client is just supported to take that yes I and mean, i do a lot of work as you know in uh consultancy organizational consultancy mainly as a kind of branch of management consultancy 
and a lot of that work is uh, essentially facilitation. So I'll have a team together for a day or two running a workshop on strategy or vision or values or something like that. And one of the lessons I learned early on from my colleagues was that um, you are exactly that, a facilitator, but not, a, not an owner. And so it's their decision and you're helping them to make the decision. But to be very careful, Robert, because you can find that, to use the phrase, the monkeys put a, on the back on your back. You know, it's your, you, you the facilitator are the one driving this. And so if it all goes horribly wrong, it's your fault. So the person helping the facilitator, in this case, the constellator, can also there be then be blamed for what you know might come out, and um, it's not in order to avoid blame that we keep the monkey off our shoulder. Although it's never nice taking blame, I think we own the process, we own the constellation as a process, but we're not owning the content. You know, the content comes from the field, and we might interpret that, but it only remains helpful for the client if they, in turn, own the outcome, own the data, the only reports that emerge from the representatives. I think that's pretty critical part of it as well. Yes. And, um, you know, it made me think about, you know, should sometimes constellations end in a place that one isn't necessarily clear or satisfying. Yeah. But a movement has happened, you know, a journey has happened. And I guess the position of the constellator is to actually trust that movement and to also trust that it continues within the client as the workshop ends and as they leave and they head back to their own life. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm thinking of a particular constellation that's coming to mind from a few years ago. A woman arrived in some distress because her husband um was difficult and becoming physically aggressive they had four children i think it was four three or four children together and her debate was do i leave him or not leave him and the constellation produced all sorts of data but one of the key bits of data was that this man and it's quite rare in constellations actually was incapable of changing and that had been her hope that he would change in some way and the conclusion of the constellation was, well, the data supports your view, which is there are arguments on both sides for staying because of the kids or leaving because of him. But the choice is up to you. So the constellation was helpful insofar as it supported her intuition, I suppose, about what was going on. It wasn't helpful insofar as it told her, do this or do that. But it, I think it was helpful at a more profound level or more useful at a more profound level in relation to something I learned from you, Nicola, actually, which is to be aware of what you call costs and consequences, that every choice has a consequence. And neither choice is really either good or bad, but every choice you make comes with a set of consequences, which sort of makes it sound very heavy, and I suppose it is. But... It also gives agency again, I think, to the issue holder. It's like, okay, I can choose to leave him and then this will follow and I'll own those things. Or I will choose to stay with him and these things will follow and I'll own those things instead. I mean, what I like about that is that um, I think maybe maybe you and I were, were um, exposed to the idea of you can have it all. Yeah. You're of the generation that you can have it all. Don't worry, nothing, you'll, nothing will be unavailable to you. And then, of course, in the in the sort of uh, laborious path of, of maturity, you discover that you can have some things. Yes. Have some things, but it's quite difficult to simultaneously have everything all the time. Mm. Therefore, there, there is this process of choice. And I really like your example of the woman who came with that constellation. Mm. In a way, my sense of it is, you know, um, more could she change, open, uh, become different in a way that it would make it possible to stay. 
Mm. That's her question in a way, isn't it? Not whether her husband, the partner, no. would, girlfriend would change, but whether whether there was an, enough um, willingness within her to, to actually be different, because she's the one coming to the constellation. You know, the partner's not there. And and so it's it's more of a self discovery, mm. and with the, with the knowledge that that it will uh, impact the, their children, you know, maybe in a good way, maybe in a not so good way, maybe in a mixed way, but I think that's it's that. And this is often a, a dilemma of parents, isn't it? Mm. Do you choose. And I have a you know I'm quite strong on this. I don't believe that people stay for in a relationship for their children. I think we have to own that we stay for ourselves, even mm. if that includes wanting to provide a you know intact environment for the children at that point in time. Mm. So there is that ownership of a choice. Yeah. Um, a connected thing there then is the um, phenomenon of an issue holder arriving, sitting next to us, and essentially saying something like, if only X would change in my life, husband, partner, friend, brother, then everything would be all right. They're the problem. Please, dear constellator, uh, set up a constellation which uh, forces them to change so that they can see how awful they are. I'm right, they're wrong, and they'll come around to my way of thinking and the world will settle according to my sort of vision. <laughs> And, you know, and I've had various versions of that. I'm sure you have one way or the other. And often, you know, the constellation kind of rather refuses to behave in that way. Um, and actually what's most helpful, are two things. One is to be reminded of this idea, which I was just then by you, that we can't make other people change. Mm -hmm. However, we can change our own behaviour and that will have an impact in turn. So if we want to change other people, the root is you know, via the self, not directly through the other. So, for example, if somebody's aggressive to us and we're aggressive in turn, as usual, then we get into the usual fights. If somebody's aggressive to us, but we're calm, the dynamic is changed. Let me take a very simple example. But in constellations, I think what's often most useful is not either you change or I change, but the mutual acknowledgement and particularly the notion of seeing you know when we each when we get people specifically to say i see you or i hadn't seen you before and then the issue holders representative says the same thing that's when often the most helpful thing takes place it's not you change according to my worldview or i change according to yours it's just both recognizing we have a kind of equal um place in the system and that seems useful genuinely useful uh, in a constellation setting because it's it's disabusing the issue holder of the fantasy that there can be control yes and that they will be the still point yeah uh, from whom nothing is required yeah and that that others will adapt mold change um reposition themselves whereas of course it, it's completely the opposite mm. And that's the illumination often in a constellation, isn't it? Yes, and it's surprising how kind of gentle it is. You know, it's, uh, you know, I sit back, I sink back into just seeing the other person. I, you know, I'm not trying to affect a big shift here, but there is an inner shift, and that's the, that's what's useful or helpful. And I think particularly in constellation work, it, one of the usefulnesses is that the, the issue holder or seeker has a representative yeah yes and actually i'm glad you mentioned that because if we talk about if we're talking about help in constellations you know the profoundest and most defining thing about constellations is we are helped as an issue holder to understand our world and our inner world by representatives who are there to help they gather with a view or at least a readiness to help the issue holder to make themselves available and actually that's a very kind of i think very beautiful form of helping representatives 
ring, the people sitting in the circle. So they don't really know in advance what they're going to be representing. They just say, I'm here as a resource. I'm here to offer myself and to kind of open. I'm a blank canvas. You can sort of paint on me kind of thing. I'm not invested in getting anything for me out of this. Although, to be fair, I mean, people do get a lot out of representing. And I, on the rare occasions I represent, I get, a, I love it. I find it so um, grounding and beautiful as a process, but I, that's not my intention in arriving in a whole in the circle. But a, a constellation depends not just on the, in fact, probably depends more on the help of the representatives than the help of the constellator in that sense and the availability that they provide. It does indeed, and that's why I'm sure you say the same thing. There is that moment when the uh, issue holder seeker <clears throat> stops at, you know, talking to the issue they're bringing, and we might often say to the representatives, uh, forget everything you've just heard because it's not useful. We're mm. looking for new information. Yeah. So that's a, a, an encouragement to to for the constellation to expand. So it's yeah. not it's not a theatrical re you know sort of revisiting of a dynamic already presented. It's something else. It's an unfolding of yeah. that hasn't been known or seen so far exactly or has been somehow disguised or forgotten or locked away um i said earlier on that i wanted to return to this notion of the resource because a representative once they step into a constellation is by definition a resource because i'm now acting as serving as somebody's uncle or uh, something abstract and you and I will often put in a figure to kind of strengthen some resolve, perhaps in a constellation. The most recent example I had um, concerned a man who had recently passed away, um, but his representative in the constellation uh, was still occupying a liminal space, as everybody calls it these days, <laughs> between life and death. You know, he wasn't hasn't hadn't fully died in his death, to put it baldly. And I put in a resource to help him settle into his death. Um, I, I gave a name to that resource, which was basically a kind of necessity, like this has happened and it's necessary that this will happen. And that had a very uh, helpful, to use the word, effect on the rest of the constellation because it enabled the life that went on and is going on after him to become disentangled from him in a helpful way because it's involved you know what would happen to the work he produced and so on and there we have the issue holder sorry the representative acting doubly as a resource it's not it wasn't just i robert i nicola i'm stepping into this constellation to be helpful but i am specifically a resource an extra bit of energy or resolve for another representative so we have a resource to another representative which fortifies them in some way and i think it's worth just mentioning that that there's a kind of extra layer of helpfulness that goes on in constellation sometimes and i'm wondering if that resource was available to all the elements presented in that constellation that yeah. it came in in one way but its reach was really far wider mm. And, and, and it's a mystery because often they're not, you know, if you uh, name a concept, yeah. the sort of systemic nuances of that is still kept intact. Yeah, no, exactly. Now I'm conscious of time, so I think uh, it's probably, we should start uh, kind of wrapping things up, but we've had a go at talking about this notion of help and the difference between help and usefulness. And I found the conversation itself very <laughs> helpful because that, as always, it's helped to move my own thinking on by talking to you, Nicola. So thank you for that. Yes, and, and I hope that I'll be just a little bit more useful the next time. <laughs> with some so wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And just to say um, to all of you watching, thank you for watching. Do please give us a thumbs up, a like on the YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss uh, further videos as they come up. And do follow up with Nicola if you'd like to. She runs uh, regular Constellations workshops. She runs trainings. She also has a private psychotherapy practice. And her uh, website is nicoladunconstellations.com. And similarly, if you'd like to follow up with me, I can be found at Robert Roland Smith.
www.thinkingdistinctly.com. Thank you very much.